consultant so the service sort of service providers well yes i mean so as we move into so this is session 13 of our 24 week pdc so we've just passed the, the halfway point and that means that we our theme for this session the next week is informed by david holmgren's principle seven um which um is the the icon of which is a spider's web and um and the 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 principle is design from patterns to detail and actually this is what we this is what a pdc is in the pdc we're teaching you the patterns not the details the details of farming and gardening and food forests and soil biology and making compost and energy and buildings and finances and local economies. There's a lot of complexity to that. But what we're trying to give you is the overview to get an understanding of, so you start by seeing the pattern and then you slowly focus into the detail. And so we're gonna start thinking about patterns in a more general way. Um, and then we're also gonna talk about patterns in design because that's what this course is about, is we're teaching you how to design using nature as a template to create abundance, to build systems that can sustain themselves, are built from local and natural resources and don't need constant inputs from outside to, to, to be able to survive. That's what, we're, that's what permaculture design is. That's, that's what we're trying to take you towards. And so, it's all very well talking about these ideas, but the question is, how do we implement them? How do we make real changes in the real world? And um, I think key to that is to be able to communicate ideas in a way in which other people can also understand what it is that you're, you know, they, they can understand the idea, how they can be part of it, how they can contribute and how they will benefit. So I think that's part of what we try and communicate in permaculture design. So, um, off we go then, and, and, and um, let me just think for a second. Um, okay, I'm gonna start, let's start off with, well, I've got some opening thoughts. Um, so we'll start with those, seeing as that's, that was what I had in mind earlier. Um, so, share screen. Okay, this is as much as to get me going as, as, as anything. Um, so here we are, session 13 on our PDC. Um, opening thoughts about patterns and this idea of design from patterns to detail. Um, here's a pattern. Um, this is the uh, average uh, temperatures for the land and sea and how since 1850 um they have risen significantly by a degree this is climate change now that's a pattern and it's not going to go away so whatever we are doing in our designing and planning we have to realize that we've got to design things to be more resilient than before. What does that mean? Well, we can expect the pattern that we are seeing is we're going, we're having, you know, a slightly more extreme, more energized weather patterns. So that means sometimes it's drought, sometimes it's not enough rain, sometimes it's too much, or all the rain comes at once, or um, many subtle changes as well. We've got to, this is a pattern that is going on around us, and we need to sort of keep in mind. And that's that, that, that this, this is a pattern that is going to inform our approach to design. We're going to have to think about in building, you know, more resilience, 
um, we accept that in some ways conditions are going to change. Um, and that might, this might be a theme that we're going to have to keep coming back to. But so just to put that out there, um, I, I, I was just looking for patterns earlier to, to sort of to get us started. And this is the SDGs, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And I quite like the idea of looking at these as a pattern, because again, it, it, it informs how we approach design. And what this is saying is our design, our society and our, our economy, our enterprises, our businesses, the, the, our um, strategies to meet our needs um, have to work in partnership with society, but they are limited. They are defined by the geophysical limits of the planet, the biosphere the weather, the water, the soil, the, the atmospheric conditions, the life on land and the life uh, below water. These are, these are critical things which also frame our design. So we design from patterns to detail. So we're thinking about, yes, this is changing background of this climate uh, a, a thing. And also as our design needs to fit within this pattern of our, the way that we are as a, as, a, as a planet, trying to see development as this, in, in this way. So I, th I thought that was useful. Um, okay, we're going to talk about zones and sectors. Uh, this is another basic pattern that we use a lot in permaculture design. And I, I find it one that's very useful. So, um, and the world's really big. Um, how do we simplify it? How do we make sense of something that's big and vast and constantly changing? Well, here's a way of thinking about it. Let's simplify it and let's just say there's five zones, okay? The first zone is centered on your home, on where you are. Um, uh, uh, and it might be the area inside and outside the home and around it. <clears throat> Let's call that zone one, because that's the zone that you actually spend maybe the most time in. Um, you notice the most things, you, you make more observations. Um, <clears throat> you invest in it because it gives you benefits back. So if we have high maintenance activities, things that need our constant attention, it's quite a good place to do it is in the zone one, just outside your house. Um, Put the baby out to sleep or, or have some sensitive um, you know, seedlings that might need your attention. Uh, grow a few herbs, perhaps for your, help your cooking or um, <clears throat> other things that you might need. Think about what you might place and locate in the, the zone one, in this area around your home. Okay, so <clears throat> if we go slightly further out, the periphery of that um, might be your garden or um the, the extent of your uh, further out into your compound or um an area where you might interact with other members of the community um a more communal space um what things might you find in a zone two space um maybe things like i don't know things you might interact with not quite so often um but say there might be some fruit trees there might be some um, so you might be growing some plants or a bit of a garden. Um, you might have some small animals or small livestock um, and so forth. So <clears throat> as you move out beyond the house, beyond the compound, beyond the, the garden immediate area, we're going from zone one to zone two to zone three. And zone three is, well, think about it as, as if you were a farmer, it's your fields, it's your main crop or it's your job, it's where you go to work. So we, we go to zone three with a sense of purpose. And we might go there regularly, but you know, to take our tools and to go out and work and, and we can't fit everything around the house. So things that, that, that need a bit more space and, and we're doing it at a bigger scale and, and so forth. So that might be pasture and livestock, it might be dairy cows and we might have the milking shed in zone two closer to the house. We might place elements into our zones so that they're, they're you know, to optimize them. 
so that we can um, maybe walk, as we walk from our house, you might go past our tool shed to get to the garden. So you arrive with your tools in your hand. <clears throat> so zone four is on a farm, on a garden. It's where you don't go very often. It's the, the fuel trees or, uh, you know, maybe a long, bigger orchard or uh, 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 maybe tr a woodland you're growing for, for timber. Um, the edges, the field boundaries, hedges, um, all of these things are zone four. You, only, you might only go into zone four occasionally and uh, you might do seasonal harvesting or seasonal maintenance, but you tend to not put high maintenance things out on the periphery of, of your farm or your land or your plot. And <clears throat> zone five is everything else. Zone five is either wilderness or, you know, the, the uncultivated, the wild, um, or it might, it might be just land that you don't own or, or it's beyond your control. And the idea about zone five is we might go into zone five to gain new ideas, to gain new perspectives. But we bring those ideas home and apply them in zone one and, and out. So we'll talk about this a bit more. I think this is a very powerful and important model. And the permaculture design idea sort of states is start from your back door and work outwards. Or in fact, start with yourself. Invest in yourself, um, your learning, new skills, new ideas. And you can take those ideas and apply them to your home apply them to the area around your home, to your garden, bring it into your work. See how slowly, slowly per permaculture ideas, methodologies, inspirations can start to permeate every area of your life. And <clears throat> this zone five thing, the wilderness, the untamed, this turns out to be so important that in permaculture they sometimes suggest is you should have a bit of wilderness in every zone have a, an ability for random associations to happen, um, things that you didn't plan. Um, again, all ideas that we can expand on as we go forward into the course. So thinking about patterns, here's a temperature pattern, here's a pattern of ideas and, and priorities, here's, here's a pattern of how we might place things on land uh, uh, according to how much we interact with them. Now, of course, um, the real world never looks like the pattern. Um, nobody's land is perfectly flat. And you're, nobody's, you know, you, it, I'm not saying your compound is completely round. These things never happen. This is the idea. In reality, that map might be twisted and shaped by the fact that there's a really steep hill behind the house here. So the zone five's up there or um, uh, we've got a, 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 a maybe woodland or something like that going across sort of a zone four and in, 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 in between a zone uh, one and two areas. So that's the idea, that's the, 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 the concept. And we can think about the kind of functions that we might put in different zones. And then also understand that the zones actually might look quite different from that according to the uniqueness of the place or, or, or you know, other considerations. So this is what we mean, design from patterns to detail. There's a pattern, there's something a bit more detailed. Um, and we're also going to talk about sectors. And, and there's, there's, there's kind of two key ideas here is, is if the zones are, are like concentric rings of a target going outwards, the sectors are like slices of a pie. Um, um, it might be access, it might be wildlife, it might be where the sun comes from, where the wind comes from. So we, we define um, sectors as energies. So it says here, prevailing on any site are powerful energies, both potentially beneficial and destructive. Wild energies like the wind, sun, the danger of fire, water, or e even wild animal flows, and views potentially all impact on the property. So permaculture landscape design takes account of these through sector analysis. 
but they are accounted for and with proper placement of design of design components they can be channeled for special uses encouraged minimized blocked deflected aimed to conserve site energy aesthetics or resources so in other words if you know which side the wind's coming from you know where to plant your windbreak if you want you can predict the movement of the sun so you can ask yourself the question is do you want the entire side of your house to be shaded or do you want it to have solar gain and depending on where you are in the on the your uh, latitude um that will change these are patterns that we can see and then conform to um do we want to have a solar gain or a solar uh, a minimum um that's for you as the designer to find out and the design of the house is informed by its location the, where the, the orientation of the house and the uh, uh, and its actual latitude and the height of the sun and the height of the sun at different seasons we're designing from patterns to detail so sector planning deals with the energies that pass through a site good design moderates these energies is a too little water is a drought too much is a flood so we need to minimize the excesses and one of the ways we might do that is through creating microclimates softening the edges creating a range of conditions uh, rather than just you know so you know, if the site is very windy we can plant shelter belts and that will reduce the wind some parts of the site might still be a bit windy others might be much less that creates then a range of opportunities so this is how we should be thinking as we approach permaculture design we're going to look at things and see the patterns we're going to think about how that fits into other perhaps long-term goals how we fit into the landscape and and then also the functions of the design that we want it to do uh yeah so a good principle work from patterns to details that's my opening thought um please if anybody wants to comment at any time please do um sometimes when i get going i just carry on but um patterns in nature so let's let's just have a think about generic patterns and types of pattern that we might see um and it's very interesting so this is looking at a kind of broccoli a kind of cabbage family plant and we're seeing kind of fractal spirals so this is a pattern that repeats on itself and you see the same pattern but at, at lots of different scales this is something we see the more we look the more we find these sort of kind of fractal type patterns we flip over a lily leaf so think about the function think how, what's so interesting is the, um the, the the lily leaf floats right and in fact we've all seen that picture of a, like a small boy sat on a big lily pad and you know they, they they're very buoyant so you can imagine that this is obviously turned upside down and here's the ribs of the leaf look how these little pockets and how obviously as the plant photosynthesizes it gives off carbon dioxide i would give off oxygen um we coming out and those little pockets and it would float it, it would trap the air that's coming out uh, as, the, as the plant is respiring and it floats so we can learn from that we can look into that and what we mean by learning from nature look at this very interesting material think about the function of the leaf and think about how the form fulfills that function soap bubbles so here's an interesting thing is soap bubbles in the air obviously are would be spherical perfectly spherical uh, if there was no wind I guess and um 
Here we're seeing them squished together. So if you push lots of spheres together, look what shape you get. You get one, two, three, four, five. Pentagon. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six. We've got hexagons and pentagons. There's a perfect and lovely five sided one, six sided one, six sided one. That one's a bit squished. So we get fives and sixes if you push circles together and then you get something that's domed. That's interesting. We're just observing nature and asking, what are we learning? This is the eye of, I guess, a fly or possibly a mosquito. And what we're seeing is it's domed, it's a curved surface. Um, and the cells on it are sixes, I think. Are they all sixes? Are they sixes and fives? Um, but look how we can see. So the same mathematics, the same forces that make soap bubbles form like that, somehow that's translated in through evolution um, into the shape of the lens of plants. Because the molecules that, that are being shaped by the same forces, the same, so that we can look at a pattern in one circumstance and learn from it and apply that in another circumstance. Um, that looks like the tail of a chameleon. And look at the, how interesting is the spiral pattern. And look about, again, think about the function of this tail, how it might be prehensile, not to hold on and help with balance. And also look how the surface of the tail, so also it can move in different directions, is in all kinds of fives and sixes. We've got the same sort of kind of patterning because we've got the same kind of function going on. So that's interesting, isn't it? Think about, so we can look into nature in all so many different ways and each time see again recurring patterns something is important about that and something about yeah we can use those observations to build our own language of patterns this is a dahlia this is a flower and look how each of these little tubes is offset from the others so we've got a really interesting spatial arrangement so there's no gaps we've got as many we managed to fit in as many of these flower tubes into the space as possible and fulfilling the function that the flower needs to do obviously for pollination creating surface area and and, and optimizing the use of space we can learn from that this is called a sundew leaf. It's a plant with a sticky resin on it and it catches insects that land on it and then digests them. Um, <coughs> pardon me. <clears throat> uh, again, we're seeing that spiral and this time with, with, with little drops on it. Perfect hexagons of this of a wasp nest it was a bee nest a bee it looks like a wasp to me anyway we've all seen these patterns in nature and think about how so when you squash circles together on a flat plane they become all hexagons it's when you want it on a curved plane they become fives and sixes you can learn from this this is a tried and tested over millions of years of evolution uh, to create the maximum strength for the minimum amount of resources to fulfill the particular function intended by the the wasp or bee whatever it is anyway here's a centipede a mellow millipede and look it's curled up to protect itself it's got its hardest armor on the outside and its vulnerable part where its legs are all tucked away and by curling up like that it's too big it's hard for a bird to swallow it so and um, that's a defensive pattern 
Now, <clears throat> when we look into the structure of plants, again, we see recurring patterns. And these patterns um, turn up again and again and again, and they're a product of the same mathematical formula. So wherever we're looking, and this is what we mean by how we can learn from observing nature, is it doesn't matter what the form is, we see universalities uh, occurring in, in, in different places. So, okay, so there's, I think, six pattern archetypes that we're going to talk about, it's sort of a pattern of patterns. One is the branching pattern, and um, we will recognize this, the branch. Um, here's a river oasis. Sorry, river uh, S. Which is what? Delta, Delta, Delta. Sorry. Um, so you can imagine as the as the as the river water heavily laden with silt starts to enter the sea, the water slows down. So the river de starts depositing the silt, which makes the water go sideways. It keeps repeating that, and over time, the river moves around and. <clears throat> Uh, but it's <clears throat> creating this branching pattern. So you can see that that's a pattern of distribution. Um, this is, I think this is your lungs, I think, is that the alveoli. So this is a, 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 a pattern cr to, to create maximum surface area so that we can exchange uh, oxygen uh, uh, across the cell walls. Um, Here's um, a dragon tree in, 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 in the Canary Islands. Um, branching pattern. So think about this, a quite simple mathematical formula is you halve, the, you, there's your single stem, and then you halve the distance and you double the amount. So you're going from one to four to eight to 16. And, um, but each time it branches, it gets smaller and smaller. And look how we've gone through, using that very simple formula, we've gone from the simplicity, straightforwardness of a single stem of the trunk of the tree, to the complexity of a pack, something that's divided and divided and divided. Now here's, here's I think, what's a, a, a fascinating lesson about patterns in nature is, you can have the same tree, the same genetics in the same place, but the pattern that it creates is always unique. And that's, it's like the, the, um, you know, your, your fingerprints are, you can, you can generalize about them, um, what type of shape they are, but that for each person, they're absolutely unique. So here's, here's a way in which we might be to think about permaculture design. You start off with a simple set of ideas and concepts. How do we live on the planet in a harmonious and abundant way? And then you break that down, ethics, principles, design tools. And then you start applying those ethics, principles, and design tools to the real world. And in the real world, the wind's blowing and there's a bird just land there. And uh, you know, one day it was hot, another day it was cold. The conditions are not always the same. So as the tree expresses its genes, as it unfolds, it's shaped by the wind, the sun, the rain, by the birds, the insects, the, the fungi, the, the, you know, the changing weather patterns. So it's always going to be unique. And this is why it's only go back to our icon for principle seven, design from patterns to detail. The icon for that, that David Holmgren gives us is the spider's web. And you've all seen a spider's web. And if you come across one, you might say to yourself, aha, I see a spider's web. But the truth is, every different type of spider uh, makes a different web. Each individual spider might make a different web. And certainly each individual spider makes a unique web according to the circumstance in which it made it on that particular day and how the wind was blowing and a, and a fly flew into it and changed the shape of it. So permaculture gives you these tools and these ideas and you're going to take them away and you're going to create something unique that's going to meet the needs of 
the um, well, the intended beneficiary of your design, of your, your client. It might be you, it might be your community, it might be your family, it might be your school. Um, uh, so you're going to take these ideas and they will manifest themselves in their own unique way. Okay, branching patterns, branching patterns. Um, also roots, think about that creating surface area, creating the function of you know, holding on to something. Um, we can learn from these, we can apply them. So this is really interesting. Obviously this is just, this is seawater uh, lapping forward and back on the beach and it's creating the same little patterns in that you might recognize as erosion gullies, but just doing it on a micro scale. Look, these little rills, see how they quickly join together and create a bigger uh, erosion feature. And then we're seeing the deposit of the sand down at the bottom. So we're having erosion at the top off and deposition at the bottom. And you can see that pattern in a little bit of, of, of water movement over sand, or you can see on a whole mountainside, and you can understand what's happening. And you can say, aha, I see the pattern. Now I can now begin to think about the detail about how we work with that, how we understand it. Um, yeah, so more, more patterns, uh, more, more uh, you know, water movement patterns. And you see how you can quickly um, identify and interpret these and understand what you're looking at. The lobe, I always want to see a cluster of, of insect eggs, uh, butterfly eggs or something. Um, when I think of this pattern, um, so lots of different elements crowded together, um, that, that maybe have a function as a whole as well. So, um, um, the penguins crowding together on, and they, to keep warm or to protect themselves or um here we have the lining of the gut this is the large intestine which has lobes which create huge amounts of surface area um i wondered about the shape of a of a city I and mean, height and think about how each one of these lobes is it's an element in itself it's a unique element in itself that's clustered together with other ones that have the same function and then that creates another sort of a third environment, the streets, the roads, the, the protection of the shade in between them. So a unique set of environments happening actually um, in and within each lobe and also then between the outside, between them and the outside, the inside. Um, we're creating many, many different environments and lots of surface area. These are design pattern archetypes really. So it's a dry stone wall, um, uh, the crinkle shaped of a, of a kale plant, um, uh, pumpkin leaves, elements crowded together, each one unique, each one responding to uh, the, the light and the environment, trying to optimize it. But look how they don't overshadow each other, that they've optimized their position so that one leaf isn't really shading out another one. Um, it's a lobed pattern. Um, here's an idea. The difference between a straight path. The advantage of this, if, um, of this straight path across my garden is that it gets me from A to B, from one side to the other, as quickly as possible. Excellent. Well, we're also kind of interested in edges and surface area, aren't we? And the way to create edges and surface area is to have sort of more three-dimensional complex shapes. So if we just go back into 2D and think simplistically, um, if I have a curved path, there's now much more interaction between the path is for the person, the green the garden is for the plants. So as I walk through here as a gardener, I'm interacting with much more of the garden. Um, this, so this is an edge effect. And I tend to, if I'm walking on the path and I see something, I'm more likely to interact with it, to pick that fruit, to take that weed, or you know, interact with the, with the garden in some way. But now I've got the problem is, yes, I'm interacting with my garden, but if I'm 
just want to go forward and back to carry materials, I've got to walk this long circuitous way. So an idea we brought into permaculture is the, uh, like a lobed path or a keyhole path. So we can still got our straight line direction to get us from A to B, from top to bottom, uh, should we need to. But we've also got access path or patterning to create an edge between me, the gardener, and the garden and the land around it. And remember how we said, you know, we mustn't compact the soil. That's why we like to have raised beds. It's why we, so that we can build soil up and not stand on it. So if we've care, if we've got um, carefully arranged elements, our, our path like this, so that we can, when we're from this point, we can reach all the way around, we can garden all around without ever touching, uh, standing on the soil, without ever compacting it. So lobed paths, look at, thinking how, look how that might create a repeating pattern, a nice mandala garden type pattern. And then think about how um, we can have a, as much garden to the minimum path, maximum garden, and strategically placed elements so that we um, we can reach everywhere and we can uh, gain maximum benefit. So loads, patterns, very interesting. Interesting what we can do with that. So look, this is what we saw with, when we looked at the eyes of the insects and of the plants was instead of being in straight lines, things were staggered, slightly offset. You can fit more elements in. Um, we can get another 16 trees in this little example here or plants by offsetting them. And also that might make the whole design much stronger because the elements are then you know, closer to each other, um, reducing say wind flow or, or, or other, other considerations. So patterning and placement to create edge, to fit, to fit things in. Um, there's our eye of the of a of a of a, of a fly again, and we're seeing again the same mixtures of uh, yeah, mainly hexagons. Um, but we've got some five, yeah, no, it is, yeah, fives and sixes to create that curved surface. Um, and then of course we have the spiral, our third pattern archetype. And we've already we saw that with the um the tail of the chameleon and the curled up centipede. Um, so what's interesting is, and again, this pattern that we see in a lot of leaves and patterning is there's, there's a numeric relationship underpinning some of this pattern formation. So mathematics creates patterns. The elements in our world are being subjected to the same forces of physics. And so it's, it, it's that's why the same patterns reoccur all the time. So this is a very interesting pattern is if we start with zero and we add zero to one, the answer is one. If we go back and we add one to one, it generates a number two. If we add one and two, that generates a number three. If we add two and three, that generates a number five. If we generate Five and eight, sorry, five and three, that gives us eight. Five and eight gives us 13. Um, that in itself is a, is a pattern. And uh, so you just keep adding the, the product to the number before. So that the next one would be 13 and eight, 21. So on on we go. So, um, and it's interesting because that numeric sequence, if you map plot it on a graph, creates a spiral. And somehow we see this, it's called a, this is called the Fibonacci series, named after a mathematician who first described it. And we see it in nature, we see it in art, we see it, we see it kind of everywhere. Um, we see it in our vegetables. We see it when we look into the into the into space, into the universe. See this, this face, the structure of galaxies, um, the unrolling of uh, of a fresh leaf, 
um, the, the spatial relationship even between our fingers and our arms, it fits the same ratios. So that we then bring these ideas into art and expression and into design. Um, Fibonacci series, well, this, this, this is something which will come up again and again, and it's, it's a very interesting thing to open up on. Spirals are really important and powerful shape, and we, we, we'll, we'll dwell on that a bit more when we get to um, principle, principle nine, small and slow solutions, yes. Um, okay. Um, I put this this pattern in. Um, I'll come back to it. This is a, a piece of cave art, art in, in Uganda, and, and I've, I've always found it very interesting. But I think we'll come back to that. And, and um, it, so we said now, pattern archetypes. You see a pattern of patterns. Okay, there's that branching pattern that we see in trees, in our lungs, in our circulation, and so in rivers branching pattern. There's a low pattern, that's lots of individual things but clustered together. There's the um, the spiral, the Fibonacci pattern. Um, and there's the net. There's the one um, that there's our spider's web. Look how well, it'll be instantly up the spider's web is, but look how it's actually quite idiosyncratic. It's, it's got a lot of detail in the middle, and then it's this, this kind of bit of blank space, and then it's maybe it's more structural further out. I don't know. But we instantly see the pattern, and then we slowly zoom in onto the detail of it. And the net is, well, this is designed to catch something, isn't it? It's trying to create a maximum surface area. Um, The, the maximum possibility of catching something by again using the minimum amount of materials so it has to have the de desired effect and obviously the size and strength of the web would reflect the size and the you know the weight of the kinds of insects the spider was hoping to catch We're designed to fulfill function and um yeah so the net Obviously, fishing nets think, um, well, this is a, 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 a structural pattern of a, of a roof, uh, a self-supporting roof. Um, uh, ripples of water, mycelium. Again, thinking about covering a lot of areas. Uh, made us think about computer systems, connecting lots of different things together in lots of different directions how um, servers and systems might work, and how, isn't it interesting that they look so much like fungal mycelium, that, that, that maybe um, the internet, which is what this is a map, a map of, um, functions very much like um, mycelial net. So there's lots to be thought of here. There's lots to be learned. Um, this is a, a map of an ecosystem, and look at these are different elements. We've got um, some plankton at the bottom. We've got the things, whatever it is, we're going up uh, up the food chain. We've got trophic level one, two, three, four, kind of five, um, and we look at all of these interconnections of how each element is either food serves as food or as a predator but for everything else. And what, what we learn is through studying ecosystems is the more connections that are between the elements in the system, the stronger the system becomes. The more connections there are between the elements in the system, the stronger the system becomes. Look, so as the spider adds, keeps adding more connections, going round and round and round and round, the, the thing gets stronger. So think about that. That network, obviously that's a physical one made out of, uh, 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 of, of spider silk, but it might be an inter uh, 
an information network. It might be a friends network. It, it might not physically exist. But so think about that. If you're designing and building a system and you want it to be strong, you want it to be many, many interconnections. Think about that. Relationships between the elements in the system, whether they are information connections, physical connections, or um, or, yeah, or the, the, the layers within a, a, a trophic pyramid within an ecosystem. Um, so that the, the number of these interconnections make the system itself um, more efficient. Um, my serial patterns, I, it really fascinates me looking at this. I, I, I think I've showed this picture already, but I pulled apart two planks of wood. I was working with them and this mycelium had explored the space between two bits of wood. And what we can see is it's got main arteries, like motorways, like main, you know, clusters of, so that, um, in some parts, the, the mycelium can, um, so this, well, yes, yeah, so these fungal mycelium is like a tube. Think of it as, as like a porous tube and inside is water and also enzymes. And when the mycelium finds something it's interested in, it likes, it's, it will subdivide and subdivide and then create a node around it and start to drip out enzymes and start to eat or dissolve interact with whatever it is that it's decided it's interested in. So there's a mixture of it wanting to send information, send enzymes and water and channel it in two directions um, across the whole thing, across the whole uh, ecosystem. And there's other areas where it wants to be really focused and create millions of surface area much you know maximum surface area where perhaps it's doing something else which trying to dissolve something so again think how the shape of the it's the same thing it's the same organism but the shape of it is 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 altered by the intended function so this might give us an idea about how to approach design in an abstract way when we look into this picture what do what can we infer from it what is it that we can nature might be teaching us um this is a, a very strong pattern because look i've damaged it here so i put my finger on it and so instead of being able to go across like this now it can reroute and use the other layers of the because it's it's also layered on top of each other it's not two-dimensional three-dimensional and um so it, it can still get from if you like from one one part to another, but now it has to go by a different route, or it can regrow. Just think about that in, a, in, in an abstract way. So again, weaving is, is the same. It's a web effect, isn't it? It's the same. It's the same pattern, and you can think about how the more connections we make, the stronger the element becomes. Okay, so there's there, there's a thought about that. So then we get to this. This is how nature is a favorite pattern. It's a scatter pattern, random patterns. Think about the, a burst of uh, seeds from a, something like a dandelion, uh, the down floating on the air. Um, and it's maybe not a very efficient way um, to send your seeds, but they're gonna go everywhere. And if you produce lots of them, yeah, it's a viable way of, um, and, and, and obviously, I get to explore the metaphor, a random assembly, just blowing seeds, blowing on the wind. But actually, then that wind's going to push them and then I get lodged into little cracks and crevices. Um, raindrops might follow them. Other materials like um, soil particles might also get lodged in the same place because they're being distributed by the same forces mixed up together. And some of those, for sure, are going to find, you know, good enough optimum conditions to enable them to grow and to carry on the cycle. So 
this might be a viable way, method of design, you know, maybe not resource efficient, but you might end up with something that works very functionally. So we're going to consider all of these as, as possibilities, really. Um, so this is a scatter pattern garden, um, an idea of mixing all the seeds together um, that we're going to grow and um, and then literally randomizing it on the surface of some carefully weeded ground and then just watching them come up and thinning them out as they grow. Um, we call this a polyculture bed, uh, uh, mixing many different seeds together and um it's a, a way of approaching garden design and if you interacting with it constantly it can be an effective way as, uh, also um and here we look zooming into that we can see different kinds of plants germinating so some of those we've planted with the idea that then we're going to pick them almost straight away like a green manure almost our uh, plants are just going to eat a little bit of green leaf some of these we might then allow to develop and become fully mature plants and we can do that slowly slowly but the fun part of this garden design is even as we're weeding it because we deliberately put all the seeds there we can just eat those weeds because uh, we know we put them there for that purpose so great if you're seed saving if you have many seeds it's a really interesting way to try to approach growing um, and this also could be done for, for um, non-productive, non-food crops as well for rewilding. Anyway, and, and then there's the wave. Think about clouds and water and water flows and the sea and the lake water and the patterns that we see in that and, um, um, water as a flow and waves, something flowing again, weaving ideas around um, seeing patterning in different forms, um, the ripples on the surface of water, um, electricity, energy is a wave, comes as a wave. It's interesting to think, think, about, think about how a wave of water can push something along in front of it. And then think about how a wave of energy or sound might travel. <clears throat> Your heartbeat is a wave. Um, yeah. And then, so we've, we've got, so we see these wave patterns. We see um, scatter patterns. We see web patterns. Everywhere we look, these net, net type patterns. We've seen arts, we see spirals everywhere we look. We see um, lobes everywhere we look. And uh, one of our key pattern archetypes is this branching tree-like pattern and nature uses it again and again and again. Clearly performs a very powerful and effective function. So these are pattern ideas we can bring into design we use these things to inspire us and to see um ways of arranging things that make them strong and durable and functional and um yeah so we have this as sort of this pattern language to draw from okay and then um the last few slides um, are just again encouraging to see how in pure geometry the fives and sixes give us a sphere so we were seeing that then variations of that on uh, the eyes of flies and the skins of uh, lizards um, this is actually um, hot igneous rock cooling down slowly and forming into uh, hexagons um these are snowflakes looking at under the microscope and interesting thing every snowflake has six sides six points see the same pattern language but every snowflake is unique 
So that's back to that tree. It's really, really interesting, isn't it? So just think about that. Every single snowflake, if you capture it and look at it under a slide, is different. And they, but they've all got the same, they were generated by the same mathematics. So we always get a six-sided uh, crystal. It's, it's, it's what we mean. So we're seeing the patterns and then from the patterns come the detail. But you have to see the pattern first. Um, it's interesting to think about the patterning of plants and that, that whether their leaves come in pairs or opposites or threes or uh, fives. Um, and um, these geodesic domes, so these are structures using the same mathematics that we saw in the eyes of flies. And then he is, um, this is actually the British Museum in London, and they're using um, variations of the, the fives and sixes. We've got lots of threes and different shapes, but to, to, um, we've got a curved building joined onto a square building. You can see how we can make very, very interesting shapes by understanding these basic principles and then playing around with them. This is um, a sea defense built out of you know cement shapes, but what shape are they? They're hexagons, because you want to make a wall that's a flat surface where each element is touching all of the other elements. So each one of these is touching another one, two, three, four, five, six other stone blocks. So that makes it really, really strong. Um, so these things are pleasing to the eye, bring it into aesthetics for fun, for creativity, for sport, but also is that same hexagon shape gives us a chicken wire. It gives us, um, again, something that's strong and uses the minimum amount of materials to perform the, perform the function of creating something that can you know, carry on on a single plane. Remember, the hexagons gives us a single plane. Um, yeah. And there's a tree which has been trained to optimize its shape as well. So, um, you know, if we think about going back to our mycelium pattern and to think about how um, this distributed pattern um, is much, much stronger than this one. So if the one on the left, um, think of it like a caterpillar, think of something like that. So it's got a backbone. So if, if there's a break between these, these square, these, if you like the principal elements, uh, the, the whole thing fails. Whereas in a dis distributed system, if one of these squares was to fail, then there's another route. You know, there's another, if this one was to disappear, this one can still go round this way. Um, so think mycelium, our, our, our fungal hyphae are channeling information. They're sending water one way, enzymes, and where they find something that feels like food that triggers it to subdivide, then to, uh, absorbs the, the duct, what it's digested, and then uses that to distribute it around the, the network to reinforce the network. So really it is like information. And we're coming to realize that in many ways, fungi are, they represent a kind of, of intelligence because they are literally mapping, exploring every aspect of their environment and where they find something interesting. They add lots and lots of detail, they, they nourish it and then they, they carry on. They nourish from it and they carry on. This is really, really interesting. So we take this simple idea and we put it in a 3D environment and suddenly now we can understand what might be going on in the fungi. And we've got, um, we've got our sort of super highway, the fast lane uh, to get from uh, across the system from the top to bottom. Um, but we've also got uh, millions of other ways to cross and get through this environment. So if there's a damage or a break, um, it can go in a different way. The information, uh, the nourishment, the, the, the enzymes, whatever it is, we go in and find an alternative route. So, hey, isn't this super interesting? This is what resilience looks like. We've got mixture of um, 
multiple multiple centers that are all connected in lots of different ways. This is what a permaculture network should look like. This might be a local group. These might be individuals. If we've got all the local groups sort of lined up and then there's some, I don't know if that's a good analogy or not, but a distributed system. This is, this is like a big power station that generates all the electricity and then sends it to all the homes. If the power station breaks, no one has any power. This is like a power system where you've got solar panels dotted on everyone's house and they're all joined together. So if one of them fails, the other one can kick in. This is a pattern of resilience. This is a pattern of resilience. This is what we're trying to learn from. And think about that in a three-dimensional way. And then that this is kind of what our how our designs need to function. So again, I hope this isn't too abstract. I I I I put this last picture in. Is this is some wood chip? Um, so just wood residues. And I was gardening one day. I was using it as a mulch. It was a sunny day. I looked and I thought, gosh, these wood chips are all stuck together in a clump. I couldn't hardly pull them apart. And I realized it's because they were all held together with mycelium. So look, this almost looks solid, but it's, it's a complex web of different strands. And look what's happening. It's dripping out this enzyme and you can see the wood is dissolving and it's becoming like a liquid. And then the, my, the, the mycelium then is absorbing it back into it again. So it's, slowly eating its environment, dissolving it, and it's doing it by creating lots and lots of surface area so it can create these interactions. This is so it's using this sort of mushy, sort of uh, spongy web matrix to create surface area and strength. And this is what we have to learn from. Okay, there's uh, some... Um, opening thoughts on patterns uh, and sort of generic patterns. Any questions or feedback or thoughts from anyone? So we talked about wanting to spot patterns and understanding that they have a kind of, um, each one serves a, a function. Thank you, Caroline. Um, to, to thinking about what the underlying function of each one of those patterns was. Um, strength, resilience, surface area, access, um, distribution, um, yeah many things um okay i'll carry on a bit it we are now in 10 minutes in so we'll do another another 20 or so minutes if no one's got anything to say um okay i'm going to do a recap um Going back to the beginning of Bill Mollison's book of the Permaculture Designer's Manual, and um, but just focusing on the design bits, and I'll, I'll try and take about 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes on this, and then we'll have a short break. Um, so things change. Things are constantly changing. Nature stand, never stands still. Part of permaculture seems to be to see those changes, see the patterns behind those changes, and to kind of move in relation to that. And um, we started again with some sort of patterns, observations set by Bill Mollison. Um, he talks about working with nature rather than against it, to assist rather than impede natural developments. He said, the problem is the solution, everything works both ways problem solution there's a relationship um 
make the least change for the maximum possible effect. So we just, we just saw in some of those patterns was the minimum material to create the maximum function. This is how permaculture works. And that's how, if you like, we're learning from nature. The yield of the system is theoretically unlimited. Think from bare rock to rainforest and everything gardens. Everything in some way is modifying the environment around it um, through its own actions. So, Bill also gave us these patterns. He told us we're moving away from this contemporary and predominantly Western idea of monocultures, of relying on doing one thing on a big scale and relying heavily on it. We're more interested in diversification, more conservation, maybe moving towards permaculture where a lot of what's going on in our land is just foraged systems. We're just actually letting nature do its own thing and we've designed it enough so that there's enough within that for us to meet our needs, for our grazing animals to meet their needs. Can, these are our design objectives. Can we create a system that just runs automatically on itself? Is that even possible? Um, this looks at inputs and outputs in um, between those three systems. And what he's saying is there's an awful lot of money and oil that go into the agriculture, whereas in permaculture, it, it, it's, it runs on sunlight and there's no waste. So concepts and themes in design. This is how, going back to the beginning of the PDC, Bill wanted us to start thinking in terms of how are we going to use this knowledge? How are we going to use the insights that we have made to create change in the world? A way in which is good for us, good for our community, and good for the natural world. Um, we were given the idea of a design science revolution. So not a, a, war, a revolution of war or of, of attrition, of, 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 of aggression, but a revolution of thinking and ideas and creativity. That's the only way that we will do that. Are you seeing this? You okay, sorry. Gerald. Yes, uh, yes, Dave. You can see that, okay. I'm just checking. Y yes, yes. Um, okay. But, oh, are you playing uh, something? Uh, no. Okay, I think someone. Someone is unmuted who perhaps should be muted. Oh, okay. Okay, Kafka. No problem. Okay, um, share screen. Okay, this is, um, we're also reminded man did not weave the web of life. He is merely a strand in it. Whatever he does to the web, he does to himself. To harm the earth is to heap contempt upon the creator. Contaminate your own bed and you will one day suffocate in your own waste. So we've got these ethics, but we've, we've got them for a reason. And, and, and we're trying to allow nature to teach us. We're, we're trying to follow nature so that we can um, be successful, be abundant. Um, we're also, this is, this is an interesting idea to come back to as well, is a policy of responsibility to relinquish power. So let's say you start a garden and you start planting plants, you're putting yourself in control, you're making you responsible. So imagine that if your garden naturalizes and becomes a food forest, that's propagating itself, you've relinquished power you've given something a life of its own so good ideas and, and good design initiatives can go on and have a life of their own so let's think about that your role as a su successful designer so the result re resolve the role of successful design is to create a self-managed system a system that runs itself just like the rainforest just like a natural system that's the potential 
uh, that we're aiming for. Um, okay, so we've reminded that ecosystems are dynamic, that there's that the elements just randomly um, fit themselves together, that they evolve in complexity and interconnections. They can train niches and there's specific little habitats. And there's a relationship between each trophic level, between the producers, uh, seeing trophic levels between the plants, um, primary, the, 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 um, the primary trophic level, the first trophic level, which is always going to be plants photosynthesizing. It's insects, frogs, fish, people, all feeding along that food chain, or in fact, linked together through a complex food web. Um, Another consideration that we are encouraged to think about in permaculture design is to really to realize that water is everything. If you've got, if you haven't got any, you can't do anything. And if you've got too much, you know, things get washed away. So we, we need to observe our landscape and, and at the broadest possible uh, 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 perspective and think about how we can slow down the flow of water, how we can make it move from where it goes from the source to the sink in a straight line. How do we make it do a long, complicated journey? Um, are the where can we trap and hold water in our landscape? How we how can we stop it from just running out? And also, we're thinking about climate resilience, we want to be able to hold as much water as we can. And we need to have maybe a sense of what's going to happen when we get too much we get a downpour as well so these are patterns we need to think about this is we need to have in the back of our head as we think about design okay so permaculture design is a system of assembling conceptual material and strategic components in a pattern which functions to benefit life in all its forms it seeks to provide a sustainable and secure place for living things on this earth. So we're trying to design for life in all of its forms, we're reminded. And um, that also says, every component of your design should function in many ways. So trees that can also be windbreaks, trees that can be, provides fruit for you and fodder for someone else, for your animals. Every essential function should be supported by many components. A flexible and conceptual design can accept progressive contributions from any direction and be modified in the light of experience. Wow, that's quite a big sentence. So a good design, you can keep adding to it and allow it to slowly grow. And as it slowly grows and you make changes, it becomes stronger and you learn and you become a better designer. So that's what we mean by a flexible conceptual design, which will accept progressive contributions bit by bit, small and steady, slow, small and steady wins the race. Design is a continuous process guided by the feedback of its own evolution. So that was our sediment model that goes from the survey analysis design, implementation and maintenance, evaluation and tweaking back into survey again. It's a continuous process. Okay, these are the foundational ideas. And then the next second phase of the design is based around analysis and asking key questions. Um, yep. Um, when we talk about elements that perform multiple functions, understand that actually everything has inputs, outputs, relationships, behaviors, activities that it does. And if we can understand that as a whole and, and as a holistic way, we can then find ways to integrate those elements into the system so that they can take care of themselves much more and they can meet their own needs from within the system. And we can cluster things together to create a, 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 an overall better impact. 
So this is a lovely picture from the designer's manual. We're imagining a sort of simplified farm moving over to something that's much more complex. We've got more soil attractment. We've got a di diversity of crops. We've got fodder trees in with the cows now. We've, we've, we've thought about integrating things together. Um, there we're seeing again a, a, a schematic of the of the of the same transformation. So we're moving from simplicity to complexity, and you can imagine that how moving this farm, changing to, to looking at something like this, there would be many small steps along the way. And as designers, we're going to ask you to think about, imagine, understand what those small steps might be. Um, we're going to design by through observation. We're going to make childlike, non-selective, fundamental questions, questioning. Uh, we can approach, think about on themes, water, energy, food, uh, access, um, what, 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 what information or data do we need? And as we um, as, as we begin to unfold this, we can also gain from our own experience. So, we're asking you to think about this design process and to use observational tools to look at, to interrogate your site, to learn from it, to act, you know, to, um, Um, and it's all in here for you to download um, is I'm just recapping this to realize that we want to bring all of these ideas with us into our design phase not just elements of it but we're trying to think about it all we're trying to understand how natural systems work and make that work for us so we might be thinking about a sequence of crops or social investment, how do we involve people? Um, how do we create community benefits? Um, and many other things, many other things. Look, so anyway, um, we've talked about zones and sectors. We've touched on gradients already and um, guilds and succession. Hopefully these, these terms now are becoming a bit more meaningful for you and you're more comfortable with using them and what we mean by that. And by all means, ask questions should you want to. Uh, so it is now 6 p.m. UK time. So I think that's about our halfway point. And um, I'm gonna just pause there. And I'm going to hand it over to you, Gerald. Any thoughts, please, or any questions from anyone else? Um, Thank you. Yeah, yes, Steve. Uh, thanks for the session. It's always, you know, interesting. Sorry, I got a midway kind of engagement, like crisis, so I had to sort it out. But then it's always interesting. This is one of the points that I wouldn't love to miss. This is where now everything starts to tie in. It's, it's like the apex where you're having now to do the linkages. Think about how the initial bits, the ethics, the principles, the first six principles and then bits of the uh, second batch of the principles that tying into now placement because from experience and from what i know however much you could be as knowledgeable or you could be as efficient as possible but if the system is not, if the placement is not, then um, a lot of efficiency is going to be lost on the way is 
it is going to somehow do sort of delay you. So it's really, this is a very interesting phase. And then it's also inviting us to think as broadly as possible, but rather in a more simplified way, especially if if you're taking the route of uh, a trainer or a project lead who is going to be taking a lead on this, uh, on either training or implementation or working with communities. Uh, thanks, Steve. Thank you, Gerald. Okay, guys, let's have, um, should we, uh, 10 minutes too much? Let's have a 10 minutes, but then we can leave it open in case uh, anyone has a question or sure. contribution, feel free to throw it in. I'll be in the background and Steve will also be around. Okay, I'm just gonna make myself a tea and I'll be right back. Yeah, sure. All right, see you in 10 minutes. Oh, that will be exactly 10 minutes past the hour because it's now six exactly where we are anyway. Oh, hi, Simon. Hi, Simon. Are we currently in a break? Yes. Yes, I've, uh, I see you've just rejoined. Um, um, were you on and probably yes, you lost indeed. connection? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. It was network problem. Okay. Hello? Okay. I guess you haven't missed a lot. Uh, maybe you could tell me where you could have hoped out, or maybe when Steve is back, he can do a quick recap. Mm. Okay. Otherwise, you're welcome to make yourself a cup of tea and then uh, quickly we catch up. We, we carry on in about, uh, that's in about eight minutes. Okay, I've placed something for members to think about. Quite interesting. What is that maybe exactly? It is can, on chat, eh? Can, yeah, on chat. Can anyone tell mm -hmm. what that is? Let me, let me check, let me check. Thank you. 
Okay, anyway, I could I would tell Steve to download it, and then he can share it and I can tell you the story behind that.
Okay, um, whilst people are just coming back, a reminder. Oh, hello, Simon. Welcome to see you. Um, watch out for Tess Fahu, and he's trying to join us as well. Um, so I'm just hearing back from a couple of other people. Um, so Paul Ogola is talking about that they have a group of 40 who are following this course in there in Homer Bay in Kenya. They went on a field trip this week, and they've been to a community farm where they have a biogas plant and, and and they're growing fodder for their animals and Paul's going to plant uh, post some pictures of that so that will be interesting and we've heard from Tess Fahuan in Ethiopia he's just been on a syntropic agroforestry course so modeling from patterns in nature for um uh kind of food forest design so it'd be very interesting to have some input from him on that hey Steve yeah yeah, so, oh, by the way, Simon, I think, needed a bit of a recap. Uh, he he dropped out along the way. But then okay. I've also shared uh, something interesting. It was at a farm in Buama. Oh, yeah. And uh, a pattern in nature or, you know, uh, a case of nature showing us form following function. That's, uh, are you able to to share that. Let me see if I can share from my end. Or maybe you can share it from your end. Then I can let the, the team can brief them quickly. Let me see. Yes. Uh, is anyone able to relate about that? Or can anyone tell what that could be? Uh, those are nests of one of those noisy birds, the weaver birds. But the interesting bit is how they are constructing their nests at the end or at the tips of that uh palm palm plant or the palm branches that is fitting you know a a form or to a function usually this is a safety uh like trick for them constructing at the end to avoid being attacked by predators, which predators are usually heavier than themselves, or probably when they are away to fend for the young ones. If, if it's a stable kind of structure, then the predator could come and just pick up the young ones or the little ones and take off with them or even the eggs. But since this is at the edge or at the end, you find by default, as a predator tries to come to pick these up, this will fold or it will create kind of a shock that is about to break and obviously the predator will have to, to fly off or to run off. So this is nature teaching us or showing us how to fit the form to function or to design to either solve a specific problem or to provide a solution. Uh, thanks, Steve, back to you. That's great. And that's a great way that you've used your own observation to illustrate that point. And you can also imagine that for the bird, Maybe it was like a scatter pattern, pattern approach. They tried building their nests everywhere and they kept getting eating unless they were at the end and they learned, eventually learned that lesson. Who knows? But we can think, see how trial and error, we learn, we apply what we learn and the system improves. That's what we're teaching. Um, <clears throat> okay, so we just had a bit of a, a recap looking through um, Mollison's principles and, and and we didn't get quite get to the end and I'm going to 
we will come back to that again because it's 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 what everything else is built on and and there's just different ways to describe the same kind of things um i'm going to show you i like to show this 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 slideshow um within the pdc and it's about design and it's about abstracting a bit about design so again this is this is this is the second half of what this course is about. It's about how do we design, how do we create change in the world, and we, I love this quote: "Design is a process of making dreams come true." What's your dream? What's the objective of your design? What is it you're trying to achieve? And the more that we can define that, and the more that we can visualize that, the, the more likely we are to be able to work towards and achieving that. And look also how. The thing that we're designing might be really complex. It might have lots of different aspects to it. So we're going to have to think through it sequentially. So sometimes we might be problem solving in one area of the design. And then another time we're looking, thinking about the whole thing. Well, look, here's someone who's done a permaculture design on their land. And it's, this is the top. These are the contours that are showing you the Contour is a line on a map drawing places of equal height. So it's 100 meters at the top and it's 80 meters at the bottom. So we've got a 20 meter fall coming down and we can see the shape of that. Um, we can see, look, there's water crossing the land. And th there's an element of the design here where they put in a series of little catchment dams. And that might be because they want to slow down the movement of water and hold water in the landscape, high in the landscape for as long as they can to have the chance of other yields. So um, we're seeing evidence of zoning. Look, here's our, here's our way in, here's the access track. And that's going to be, a that could be a key limiting factor in your design is maybe you haven't got many choices where you could get your access in. But once that's decided, that's then going to inf inform you what comes next. So the home, the homestead needs to be close to the access because we're going to be delivering them building materials there. And then when you live there, you might be traveling in and out or having other deliveries. So there's our zone one. So we know where the zone, and once we've located the house, there might be a lot of considerations where to put it, of course. But once we've thought about that, where it is within the land, where it is, how it is accessible it is, how sunny it is, how windy it is. We can then begin to place elements around the house that support the house function, the zone two function. And look, we've got some raised beds, we've got a nice little mandalari looking garden and you know different elements, things around the house there. So there's a zone, zone one and zone two kind of things going on. Um, this is over here, bush regeneration. So right on the periphery, zone five, we're just letting this go wild, look. All of this red stuff here is a zone five. Uh, commercial production of trees. So this is the main part of the farm, look. And all of that, that's the zone three. That's the, the bit where they're doing their most intensive work. And then we've also got uh, grape, yard, grape vines there on the sunny slope. And we've got um, cold climate orchard and stone fruit. So look, we've put the cold climate plants at the bottom because cold air is heavier and it'll slump down and it'll be a bit cooler down there uh, at night time. So we're having a looking at looking at somebody's approximate design, and we're just appreciating that they've thought about zones, sectors, placement within that. Okay, so this was their process of making their dreams come true. Um, and what's going to be yours? Okay, this is a, there's actually a lovely talk on YouTube by Janine Benyus, in which she talks about biomimicry, copying life, copying nature. And in, in, in her She's not a permaculture person per se, but she's doing exactly the same as what we're doing, learning from nature. And she synthesizes, uh, sort of summarizes the um, principles of, of biomimicry as nine things. 
Nature runs on sunlight. Nature uses only the energy it needs. Nature fits form to function. In other words, doesn't matter what it looks like, does it do the job? So I've got a picture of a moth with a long proboscis. It might look pretty funny, but it does, it fulfills the function. Nature recycles everything, produce no waste. Nature rewards cooperation. That's integrate rather than segregate. Um, nature banks on diversity. Nature demands local expertise. Demands. So that's so that's the detail, you know, and we, we need to get things in the right place. Um, nature curbs excesses from within. Nature taps the power of limits. So all of these actually relate very strongly to our um, our 12 design principles. Uh, uh, but it's interesting to hear them articulated in a different way. If are you sharing? Oh, sorry, am I not? No, you're not. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Uh. Oh, sorry about that, people. Um, I hope you can see that properly now. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We haven't many. Really, oh, so I'm sorry. I was looking at I was describing this image which you didn't see. Yeah. Um, saying it was, this is the top of the land, this is the bottom, here's the access and the home, and then the elements that support the home clustered around that. And then um, as we move further away, we have less intensive from zone three, zone four, zone five. Um, you, and, and, and look how, it, it, when we look at this design overview, there's lots of different elements there and they're, they're carefully placed to support the function of catching water, reducing erosion, creating wind shelter, allowing for access, creating yields, exploring the different microclimates of the, of the space, understanding the difference between the top and the bottom. Look, we've got a shelter belt planting all along here to keep the cold winds off. And think about how within our design we're designing to fulfill a range of different functions we've created the gardens to support the house we've got the the wider ecosystem for for uh, farming we've got the water treatment and so on and so forth <clears throat> it's this process of making our own dreams come true dreams that run on sunlight only use the nature as that is needed that fits forms to function, recycles everything, rewards cooperation, banks on diversity, speaks of local expertise, and is self-regulating and taps the power of limits. That's, what, that's where we're going. Um, here we've got another set of ideas. Life creates the conditions conducive to life. Adapt to changing conditions. Be locally attuned and responsible. Use life-friendly chemistry. Be resource efficient. Integrate development with growth. Evolve to survive. Okay, same ideas, but just being expressed using different words from different sources. So um, a friend of mine put this slideshow together quite a few years ago to, make, to help me think about design. And he was a guitar builder, was someone who made musical instruments. And so he made it about musical instruments. And let's just say this is a, we can, we can use the thinking of permaculture design to design anything. It doesn't have to be a garden or a community. So let we, so there's, you know, so we can think about it in an abstract way a little bit as well. And I think that's a fun thing to do here. So, Take a big deep breath. 
We want to design. We want to create change in the world. We want to design to meet our needs. So we're going to be, how we approach design and, 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 and what we do, what we're aiming to achieve with it and the, the steps that we might take will be really informed by the function, the application. What's our primary objective? There might be lots of objective, but we need to make sure that we're fulfilling those primary applications. Um, and so, yeah, he called it application. We, we, we quite often say function, to design, to fulfill function. And then also is what materials have we got? And again, is let's look around, let's see what's locally available, what's, what's abundant, what's cheap, what's affordable, what's strong, what can we grow? Um, and whatever design we come up with is going to be a two-way interaction of those things. So again, back to the idea when I, when I showed you the dragon tree and talked about every, every design is going to be unique because it's going to be an interaction between the, the design process, the designer, the decisions that are made, the functions we're trying to achieve and the materials that we have to, to, to achieve them out of. But it needs to fulfill the function. And if it's done that, it will work and it will go ahead and you can build on it. So thoughts on musical instruments, um, how perhaps this is um, um, a, a bone, a piece of bone from a bird. It's about 50,000 years old and clearly it's been worked. It's got some holes in it. And um, the proposition is, imagine this, you're sat around the fire, you're eating, you're, you're, you know, eating, sucking on, sucking the marrow out of your out of a, 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 your, you know, whatever it is you're eating, this animal bone. And as you suck it, it goes, Toot! you get a little noise. And you go, oh, how exciting, how fun. And then you, as a designer, you've got this material, then you, you identify the applications. I can make a noise with it. Oh, I can play with that. So now I can fine tune it. And from not just being able to make one noise, I can put a series of holes in it and so I've made a flute. I can make a series of noises. I can compose a tune. So think of, see how you as a designer might have some basic materials and a sense of application. And by experimentation, two way playing with it, come up with something. You might come up with something new. You might come up with something significantly better than what you, you know, you know what, 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 what might happen is the realm of possibilities might open up. You see more chances. So imagine this. Um, a bent stick with a bit of animal gut on it. And if you, and it's tensed because the stick is bent. So if you touch it with your thumb, it's going to go doing. It's going to make a noise. Um, that bow might have been for hunting. It might have been for starting fires. It might have just been created for the making the noise, who knows? But again, think about how creativity um, and, and experimentation might create, um, oops, something that didn't, didn't exist before. The designer coming up with an application and interacting with materials. So in this case, we've got a stick, we've got a bit of an animal gut, we've noticed that it goes doing, so we've constructed that thing, this little bow, and the next observation is, oh, if we put it on the edge of our mouth and use our mouth, our buccal cavity, our mouth cavity as a huh, sound echoing, we can make a much more, and I can maybe open and close my mouth, I can make a range of different sounds. And you can imagine how people would just playing with materials, playing around, oh, looks not that funny, the sound it makes, quickly becomes a powerful tool of communication. So this is a, a berimbau, this is, a, this is a, a, a traditional Brazilian instrument, and you can see now how a coconut shell um, performs the, the, the function of, of, the, of the mouth cavity to amplify the noise, the bedoying noise. Okay, so now we can create musical forms based on amplification of the vibration of a wire. This could be, a, or, 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 or of a piece of animal gut. So this could go back right back in time to as far as you could possibly imagine. Um, you might innovate with that design. Here we might have, this, this, uh, let's say it's a turtle shell, I don't know. Um, it looks like it's worked. 
it now has, it's not just uh, an amplifier, it's got a skin on it, so now that resonates. But we can have strings, more than one string, and those strings could have be of different lengths. Now we've got a doing, doing, doing. We've got a, a, a bigger range of sounds. We have new possibilities. So all this is, this is design. This is your permaculture garden evolving. Start off with a very simple notion, very simple materials. But quickly, you can, you can innovate. You can add things. You can begin to understand how things work. You can start to layer it, build more complexity into what you're doing. And the next thing you know, here we are, um, you know, some, some, a, a fantastic inlaid with ivory and ebony um, a guitar from the 17th century, probably cost a fortune, a statement of human artistry, maybe created for more than, you can see this is like a folk instrument that this is for playing around the fire for people to come together. I think this is more a statement of ostentation and of, of oh, well, and also showing off of artist artistry, but it creates a different kind of thing. But it, the the form fulfills the function. So if all we're interested in is making a noise, it doesn't need to be any more complex than that. Um, on we go. Think about guitars. Think about violins. Think about mu musicianship and how how important that is, and that how, especially in the sort of European era, that instruments became these precision things actually became very expensive and, and you'd have to go and study to learn how to use it. And you'd obviously have to be reasonably wealthy to have such a thing. And so they occupied a very different place in society as, as something like this. Um, but they're still really saving the first serving the same function and then sometime after the war or even in between the wars i think something really amazing happened and and, and that is with the industrial process they learned how to mass produce guitars and suddenly musical instruments could were available to people who never had them before to people who'd only ever had the homespun equivalent of something like this a string that goes kadoing or possibly, you know, uh, something slightly more um, complex. And then through industrial process, suddenly, this is Charlie Christian, who's a, a jazz innovator and one of the very first uh, people to take the, popularize the guitar. <laughs> Jimi Hendrix, just a few decades later, um, could have been being one, becoming one of the most kind of ultimate musicians. Um, but the key underlining is actually the, the guitar makers managed to create a tool which does the job really well, really effectively, as good as that amazing Martin guitar with all of the ingrain on it, but it could be produced in a factory cheaply. So it, and what happens is if you put this, a tool as powerful as a friend of Strat Stratocaster, which is what this guitar is, you put that in the hand, make that available to, to, to people, and then let them innovate is they come up with so much diversity. They come up, look, it's made from simple components. Um, it's not, you know, it's not out of reach. You can make very, very beautiful instruments out of it. Um, but then that, 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 if you like, that can be interpreted and expressed in many different ways and crazy fun, different shapes. Um, but also what happened was putting these instruments in the hands of lots and lots of people in the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, created whole new musical forms that hadn't existed before. And suddenly a whole new kind of vistas of possibility that no one had ever thought about. So this guy here is, is just an interesting story. It's just to think about design a tiny little bit. His name is Tony, Tony Iommi, and he comes from Birmingham. And in Birmingham, they used to do a lot of heavy industry. When he was a young man working in a factory, he lost the tips of his fingers in a, with a big power hammer slammed down on his hand. And um, later on, he became a musician. So we had to work around the fact that he didn't have fingertips. They came up with the idea at the time of, I think at the time, it was a very popular um, horror film. And they were watching people queuing up outside the cinema to watch a horror film, something that would scare you. And they were going to a rehearsal and they said to each other, 
what would be the musical equivalent of a horror movie? So rather than music that's happy and makes you joyous, but something that's like scary and dark and thunderous. And, uh, and they went away and they created, invented heavy metal, <laughs> um, a whole new form of music, which is now has many thousands of subgenres and different bands. But that idea created a whole new kind of universe of possibilities. So your design can do that. Your design can open up potentials that, that before you couldn't have even dreamt that were there. So this is another, in the, to carry on the guitar analogy, this is a guy called Django Reinhardt. Now he grew up in Kamar, gypsy, uh, Romani tradition, um, living in a caravan and moving around. And as a baby, there was a fire in his uh, caravan and he lost uh, two fingers and half a thumb in the fire. So he only has half a, half a hand. And he later became a, a sensational guitar player, but he had to create his own style of playing that suited someone that only has two and a half fingers because he couldn't play like everybody else. So he created a new style within the limitations of what he had. So think about that, that design has, a, you, if you design two limiting factors, I've only got two and a half fingers. I'm not going to be doing certain kinds of styles of playing, but I can do intricate picking, which is what Django Reinhardt did in a, in a really rhythmic way. So he created his own style of playing that now other people with five fingers try to emulate and can't. So we design to limitations, design to fulfill functions, and we realize you just use what you have. Okay, and you get creative. You can make guitars look like anything. You can do all sorts of crazy things with them, but do they still play music? Can you, um, uh, you know, afford to buy it? Can you afford to fix it? These, these are key ideas. Okay. There's some thoughts about design from a, of someone who genuinely was a, was a, a guitar designer. So I, I thought that's, I hope that was interesting. Um, I'm going to go through the sort of permaculture design models a bit further. Oh yeah. Okay. I hear you, Nicholas, you have to go because it's raining. So you will um, get it later. Yeah. Okay, so this is, this is, this is, this is, this is, I think when I put this, I, I, I wrote this slideshow a long time ago, and I think what I wanted to say through it was there's, there's, there's plenty of ways to approach this, it, uh, uh, but I want you to think about it as a process and, uh, and as quite a creative process, but you can approach it in different ways. We've given you this Sadie Met model so that you've got step by step thing to go through. But I'm, I'm going to kind of show you how we got to that and where that comes from. And again, more thoughts about how to think about design. Um, so in this, we're going to look at the, this, the scientific process um, and then two or three other examples. So um, in science, we say we, we make some observations and we might then we ask some fundamental questions is why is that like that? Um, we might have an idea, so we construct a test to find out if our hypothesis, our idea, if it is true or if it's false. Um, so we, we run a test, we look at the results and draw conclusions from those results. There's us, that's the, the methodology, if you like, that the whole the modern world is, is built on, the scientific process. But of course it has a feedback loop in it because it's got to be a bit smarter than that. And um, so let's say um, we have our question, we do some research, we construct our hypothesis, uh, we come up with a test to test our hypothesis, um, and we look at the results and draw conclusions. If it's true, we might go ahead and report those results, uh, write a paper, construct another test, or if it didn't work, we might, or only partially worked, that's still a result, so we've learned from that, but then we might fine tune our test, fine tune our hypothesis, and go around the process again and keep trying until we get the right result. So Gerald's birds might try putting their nests anywhere along that frond, but the ones that do it on the end learn that that's the safe place to do it, 
that reinforces that behavior. That's how we learn. That's how it works. So through design, we test our ideas and we test our ideas. And as they, as we learn, we can then implement them with increasing confidence. This is also why we encourage you to start small and to build on your successes. Right, um, that, that's a good way to use your energy. Um, that's a scientific method. Uh, so the biggest selling, one of the biggest selling permaculture books in, especially in the US, is written by a guy called Toby Hemingway. And he's, he's a very good author and a very good communicator, sadly passed away now. Um, and in his book, he talks about, it always starts with observation. It always starts with you looking at the, the problem. We talked to you about, you got to interrogate the client, you got to interrogate the site, you're going to interrogate any kind of historical data there might be, and you're going to look for leaks. That's what, that's your observation plan. From that, you can begin visioning, having ideas. Hmm, let's try this, let's try that. We might start off by thinking that in a vague idea, in a conceptual, big picture, broad brush kind of way, and then slowly theme focus down to, to a schematic design, something a bit more uh, 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 detailed and 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 which is built on what we've thought the thinking we've done before and i showed you how we did that in our garden in newtown and our so our garden project that created the cultivate horticulture center um so then we would go to going to go we're going to go into developing our design ideas and we're going to then begin to implement it okay so we get this process from science from toby hemingway and this is a book called The Universal Traveller. I, I, I just picked this slide up from someone I don't, haven't read it. But I like the idea from this, and it says, accept responsibility. Who's going to make this change? I am. We are. We're going to take the lead in this, okay? We're gonna analyze, we're gonna do some thinking, observe. Um, we're going to define the problem generate ideas, choose which ones of those we like, and then begin to implement them. And we can generate lots of ideas, we'll be really creative, and then we can spend some time really sifting through them and finding out the maybe the most important ones, think about which ones we want to do first, and then we can then begin to implement and evaluate. As, as we implement, is it working? Is it doing what we wanted to do? Um, are there any un unintended consequences? So this is a nice, again, these all, notice how these are very, very similar. And you're just trying to synth synthesize these together. Um, this is a, a four part model of um, called patterns of creativity a synthesis model. So, and again, let's think about creativity. Let's think about design, how we um, make our dreams come true. Let's say it has three, it has these four stages to it. That we start off with, here you are living with it, in your house, looking at your land, looking at the problem you want to solve, experiencing it. So the first stage of the, your design is going to be preparation okay and that preparation is going to be the observation interrogate the land interrogate the client uh, understand the history look for the leaks um understand the seasons the changes the materials that might be available all of those things that we touched on last week is part of your preparation okay so the we then feed all of the observation into the next stage, which is the analysis. So what did our observations mean? Can we make some sense of that? Um, um, and as we enter stage two, imagination, can we start generating ideas based on our analysis, based on what it's telling us? Well, the climate's like this, the resources are like that, the, the needs are this, these are the things that we, you know, the, the, the available materials that we have. We're now gonna generate ideas 
and we're going to then start um, sifting through those ideas, harvesting them, picking out the ones that look the most important. So we've gone from experiencing it, to thinking about it analytically, and then generating ideas, picking out the best ones, fine tuning them, and then so yeah, look how look at these four stages: preparation, imagination, development, action. We do the action. And then we observe to see how it worked. Then we carry on and that understanding that we know what, what's good, what, what's not, what, what, what do we need to keep changing? We come up with solutions. We fine tune those solutions. We apply them. Are they doing what we want them to do? You know, ongoing. So again, this ongoing process of design being open-ended, ongoing, inclusive, informed by feedback informed by your experience of the design and you keep asking the fundamental question what well, is it doing the function that we intended is it are we getting outputs that we wanted and there's our sadimat drawing so that's the stat if you like is trying to it is a, it's a, I, I did a, a an easier to look at powerpoint a, a pdf of this last week so um but yeah, it, we try to show how you're incorporating all of these ideas in a step-by-step -step process that actually is continual and moves from experiencing the, 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 the current situation, making observations, analyzing those things, and then coming up with, um, with ideas to address the issues that you're experiencing. Um, so there we are. We'll go back and just touch on our patterns the detail this is where we are we 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 we, we are using now our, our permaculture thinking to understand or look at the energies that there might be on a piece of land that we're interested in um can we think about the sun and the shade the slope uh, how water is going to move that land through that land uh, where where does the wind come from other issues with noise or light, other particularly beautiful views that we want, other things we might want to block out. How will neighborhood, how will um, wildlife cross the land or, or come, to the, come to that, how will the neighboring kids cross the land? Do you need to be concerned about fire? What happens if there's a bushfire? Um, can we, do, we, do we need to design for that? Um, if we were to look at say our home, and if there's our zone one, and we, we, we're trying to understand the, the, the wild energies around it. Let's just understand that if there was a bushfire, warm air rises. So what happens when there's a fire is it goes uphill. Okay. Um, so, and it's going to be driven by what? The wind. So if we understand how, how the, the winds work and the slope works, we might be able to think a bit more about uh, fire um, exposure and we might want to bring that consideration into our design if we know where the winds are we might want to design to shelter the property or to um so we get a sense of where we're going to act when we come to the design phase have a sense of where we're going to place our elements so that they fulfill multiple functions um we talked about the zones. So, and again, thinking about how here, on this picture here, we're seeing sort of zones and sectors working together. There's our settlement in zone one in the middle and our more intensive activities in the zone two, main crops in zone three, and then the periphery of the farm, the edges and the hedges out on zone four. And then zone four connects through to zone five, to the outside, to, to the wilderness. And, and we might want to invite, invite some of that wilderness actually down into the heart of our land. That might be a wildlife corridor or some forestry or hedges. It might be a river. Um, might be lots of different ways that you, uh, that again, that wildlife might track across your land. Um, can we design for it? Can we design so that animals, if, if wild animals do come onto our land, 
they deflected and stay out in the zone four and maybe don't come into the zone two and eat our crops. If we can spot those patterns, we might be able to bring that into our design. And again, taking that overview look and think about what, what's going to happen when it rains? Where's the water going to go? What happens if we get a lot? What happens if we don't get enough? Understanding the, the shape and the size of the land is, is, is very, very important. And the, the, the two, yeah, water, slope, pathways, and then the key, key elements like buildings. Um, we need to get these things right first. And the shape of the land and where there is water will also influences where we can locate key elements and also where the access and pathways are. So we are also designing with a sense of priority. We're always going to need access is going to be key. We can't do anything without water and we're never on flat land or very rarely on totally flat land. So it is going to be considerations that shape the whole design from the beginning. Um, yeah, it's thinking about the sun and sun angles, uh, designing to the detail of the climate that we're in, asking ourselves whether we want thermal gain or thermal loss in our buildings, and being aware of where we might place a building within the landscape so that it either is has a, a, a yeah, solar leg, a gain or solar loss. Uh, we can model how the sun moves around if we find it hard to visualize. There, there are apps now you can use on your phone which tell you. Um, in urban settings, you know, there might be intrusive noise and lights from neighbors or from, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, other enterprises. We might plant strategically for privacy, for suppressing noise, um, uh, for keeping, um, uh, yeah, if we understand how wind flows around the house as well, then that's going to also inform us of where to locate elements so that they fulfill intended functions. If you're going to plant a windbreak, why not plant a windbreak that has other functions? It's a biomass yield. It's good for wildlife and nature. It also adds to privacy. So think about how we use design to address fulfilling functions. Now, I think this is a key consideration and one I like to repeat. Um, always remember that water front runs downhill. So when we say water is a key consideration, we can also predict where it's going to go. Whoops. And we can design for that. So if we are aware of the shape of the land and of, of the topography, we can model it or visualize that in a way and then we can then build strategies we can strategically arrange elements to slow down that passage of that water through the landscape um we can uh start our stock at the top encourage us instead encourage the animals to move sideways rather than up and down so that their hooves don't create gullies We've restricted their movements. We've added swales to trap water and allow that to feed the trees, which are also going to stabilize the landscape. So we start with the rainy season up on the top of the hill. And as the season moves on, we bring the cattle or the animals down uh, sequentially because we can then follow the grazing and follow the water. So the last um, fields to graze will be, well, there'll still be some fresh green grass will be at the bottom. And again, we can observe these patterns and then follow them. We can reinforce them by strategically placing elements in the system to fulfill the overall design. We choose elements that fulfill multiple functions so that we get shade trees, help feed our animals or maybe help build soil or good for nesting birds or fulfill a variety of other intended functions have long-term timber value that's called stacking functions we have elements that perform multiple functions um, a water catchment system that's fulfilling multiple functions 
uh, channeling any surplus water, making sure it catches it and feeds it into the dam. Um, we have a high level dam, a mid level dam, and then an outflow coming down the bottom here in, in this designed system. Um, so when what because we, because water is always going to flow downhill, we can predict where it's kind of going to go, and we can put systems in place to harvest it and control that flow. But if we get a heavy surplus overflow of rain, which might happen, the dam needs somewhere to discharge. And the rule is we always want to discharge water um, along contours and or as shallow as possible. And if it does overflows, it, we discharge always into vegetation, into vetiver hedges, and and contour plantings of trees um so that again think about how these elements that we've put in for our grazing system might also perform a function for our water catchment management system and reducing um, erosion causing runoff and heavy rainfalls um think of strategies to hold on to every bit of water feed it into the system and then make it travel as long a distance as possible um, so that it can nourish the landscape, so that it can humidify soils and plants. That's, that's our design consideration. We're always thinking about how water is going to move through the system. How do we slow it down? How do we stop erosion? If we can understand the shape of the land, we can predict where it's going to go, and we can then have systems in place to manage it, to harvest its energy and to get the maximum benefit before we let it leave back down back down into the system, re rejoin the system. Um, if we're really clever, we can connect dams together. If we work on contour, we could make water flow slowly, slowly along a great distance and um, create interconnected systems. The only upper limit to what you can achieve is your own imagination. If we can make, if we can get multiple uses from each resource before we let it go, the system itself becomes more productive. Thoughts about design, We're going through our sediment process. We are also trying to maximize edges. There's more interactions at an edge. So where a, a, a pond meets the shore, you get a really interesting, unique set of conditions. Um, it's not quite land, it's not quite water. Sorts of creatures can get in and out and, and, and get the benefit of both sets of conditions. So let's say all of these ponds have the same surface area of water, but clearly this one has much more edge. There's much more chance, much more opportunity for things to interact between the land and the water. And so therefore we might explore different shapes to fulfill different functions. This is like your palette of ideas that you can play with as when you come into your design thinking. So this is from the designs manual. Here's a, a lobed pond following from this basic pattern idea. And it's not just, so it's got a range of different conditions. It's also deeper in the middle. So I, I like this idea here that this is a, this is this is a, an imagined fish farm so we have the tiny little fish fry in the shallow waters which is the environment that suits them the microclimate that they would favor and then obviously get a bit bigger they explore into deeper water and then the fully adult fish here in the, de the deepest bit in the middle um and that by having a lobed pond maybe and with 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 with, with look carefully planted tr shelter trees it's saying there oh winter winds are sh kept off by strategic planting we've got uh and and this one lets lets the summer sun summer winds come in you know they've thought about sectors they've thought about the requirements of the elements within the system and they've created a diversity of habitats just by exploring shape and depth so think how we can be really creative in permaculture design. So in the same way as we can predict where water will go and where water will end up, we can also predict air flows, warm air rises. 
co and that's because cold air is heavier. So actually, it's the cold air sinks and pushes up the warm air. And if you have a large body of water, like the sea, like Lake Victoria, next to the land, what happens is the as the sun rises in the morning and the um, and the temperature rises, the land heats up faster than the water. It's more responsive. So you get a convection current coming off the land and um, cold air sinking down over the water. So we, there we're seeing we're having we're seeing the uh, 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 cool damp air coming onto the land and warmer dry air leaving it. And then in the evening time, the land cools down quicker and the water holds its temperature for longer. So now we're seeing warm, wet air lying, rising off the lake and coming this way and the cooler, drier air slumping down. So we, we're seeing a reverse of so air pressure and the airflow being affected by the relative heating and cooling of two different bodies. That's something we can bring into design. We can think about whether we can predict where these air flows are going to go and we can decide if we want to push cold air away, invite it in, and the same with hot air. We're seeing the patterns and then we're zoning in on the detail. Remember when we talked about our, the um, heating and cooling of buildings and we looked at termite mounds, this is the same ideas. So, um, cold air is heavier um, and we certainly have, if that cold air is less than zero, it forms frost, ice f forms, and that will kill plants. And um, so something that we observe is you get hollows, you get places where cold air gets trapped and it becomes particularly cold there. And this can happen either behind or like a wall of things or just reaching at the lower lower parts of a landscape. So making observations, we can understand the microclimates of a landscape, understand how cold air crosses, uh, might cross it. So here, look, here's an example, looking down a hill, we're on a uh, in a field looking down the hill, and there's a hedge line, look, a line of trees and shrubs, and you can see the cold, damp air is trapped behind it and it's sort of welled up almost like water behind a dam so that's a frost pocket a cold air pocket so you need to be aware you could need to think about things like that you might want to change the shape of the landscape to reduce that effect um you might want to build your house down there in the cooler air or you might want to come up here in the warmer air all of these from observing landscapes, help us understand, and then we can think about how to use these factors in design. Here's an orchard in a, in a steep valley and cold air at nighttime comes tumbling down from the mountain and it might damage the trees, give them a frost, they might lose their blossom, might lose the fruits. But a simple, um, Construction, even just a fence, um, it just adds a little bit of wind resistance, slows down the flow of the air, so then the majority of that cold air actually is pushed off and travels around. It will always take the path of least resistance. So in the same ways we can direct the flow of water or we, could di we can direct the flow of cold air. We can direct the flow of wild animals. We can di direct the flow of people by strategic placement of elements to fulfill a function. In this case, diverting the, the wind, but it might also fulfill other functions like keeping wild animals out or stop the uh, children from stealing your fruits, whatever the reason might be. So, um, this is a humid landscape we're looking at on a slope. Um, and We've got three dams placed on this. So, and this is um, sort of an exploration, exp exploration of um, 
slope, altitude, and a few thoughts about how um, how 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 cold air and warm air might move across our landscape. Um, we might have high meadow up at the top on the hilltop, so we might be able to take our animals up there in the spring. Um, it talks about a ridge forest on this steep slope, more than 20 degrees, um, 18 degrees, greater than 18 degrees to be forested. And then we can cultivate further down. And we're also seeing how um, the falling of the cold night air coming down interacts with warm air rising and careful placement of elements. This, this ridge point dam, this house, this um, food forest um, helps maintain and explore the local um, microclimate conditions so that the cold air coming down the mountain doesn't just dump onto your house. Um, and an exploration of the best place to live is just below this inflection point where the landscape moves from being uh, greater than 18 to less than 18 degrees. And then here we can start building swales and more detailed water catchment. And then, um, yeah, we've got a, a low dam at the bottom. And we're seeing again how warm and cold air mixes together. There's a lot in these pictures. Anyway, so we started off by thinking about the things that we can't change, the shape, the, the, the shape of the land, access, where the key elements like houses are going to be built. And then we can think about the other systems, uh, food growing systems, our sort of water management systems, um, other shelter and built environment ele elements. Are we harvesting energy and energy treatment? Um, and the production and use of the physical resources on the land and how we're going to re reuse anything that otherwise might be regarded as waste. So we need to build physical systems that sit in the landscape that address these issues. Um, so here we again seeing a designed system which is an assembly of elements to fulfill a set of functions. Um, there's in transect, so seeing across, there's a little chicken house, there's some chickens, there's a swale and a food forest and, uh, and a little forest system, and then we move to the same field again, further down. Looking at, looking at it from an angle, oh, we also see that we've got, um, uh, that we've got a really carefully shaped uh, forest around the outside that acts as um, a shelter belt, a protection, and as a sun trap, that the energy of the sun can be focused in this space. We've got our chickens, maybe this is a cooler climate. Um, so we've got an assemblage of elements that meet the needs of the chickens. There's some fodder for them. There's the tree system for them. There's the house and there's a, a little management thing. So strategic placement of elements to fulfill functions. Um, here's exploring the edges around buildings, thinking about potentials of balconies, uh, catching the runoff from roofs, um, channeling that into places where we can use, usefully use it. Exploring vertical space, uh, lateral space, hanging space, um, interesting edge spaces. It's a little bit sheltered and a little bit, you know, maybe protected. Um, even around a window, if we can open a window, we can have, we can start to explore the edges. Could we have a window box or trellises going up the other side? Uh, could we grow something go across the top? You know, the only upper limit is your own imagination. We can stack productivity and creativity into the landscape, food systems, water systems, shelter for animals, shelter for other beneficial species, so that we create a system which largely is self-managing. 
um, and we don't have to do too much work. Um, we can train plants to be optimized for carrying, the, catching the sun. They can f f fulfill other functions like being barriers or looking beautiful or giving privacy or windbreak. Think about how the strategic placement of elements um, can help those then elements perform other functions. Uh, how this, this tree's been carefully managed and pruned, so it's just all in one plane. It just goes from side to side, up and down. There's no coming forward and back. So um, it fits very neatly into a small space and yet gives us lots of catch and store energy, lots of edge, lots of surface area to gain from the sun. Um, growing things in pots. Yeah, okay, I'm going to um, pause because I think I'm rushing into this a little bit. Um, we've got 20 minutes. Um, I'm just going to pause. I'm going to, we can chat a bit. Now, so perhaps we can talk a little bit about um, how we're going to go through this design project part of the course as well. So hopefully I didn't. Hopefully everyone was happy with that. I saw Caroline dropped in and out a little bit. Um, but yeah, the recording is there. So firstly, any any questions or any points anyone would like to make in relation to what I've presented so far today? Um, yes, zones, <coughs> zones and sectors play you know a crucial role in the overall design process but then sometimes you realize that through critical observation you may realize that within your environment probably or within your locality or the community you have bits of accidental yet you know proper or accidental kind of zoning. Uh, I was talking to one of the groups and I told them, this probably leads us to the fact that uh, permaculture or natural systems mainly rely on the indigenous knowledge. That yes, it could be, you could look at it as accidental, but then probably it's not is just that someone did it earlier. So also it reflects back to the segment uh, where you're looking at also people's existing knowledge and previous, previous projects as part of your input or something that you can really observe and look out for. Uh, I think that's it for now. It, when Steve was showing that other image of the trees, we had a similar compulsion that those trees as windbreakers, you know, that image of the tree rows. And we discussed the difference in case of a strong wind, if you have such a windbreaker or such a natural windbreakers versus, uh, you know, an in a wall or a brick wall, uh, we at, at the end of the discussion, we realized that this is going to be with a brick wall. You're actually not slowing it down. You're just slightly deflecting it over and it will land with even a harder force. But with such a design, a natural design or a natural pattern, you're slowing it down and you're not rather escalating it or creating uh, maybe steve could uh, explain a little bit more on that on the dynamics of that yeah no it's, it's good <clears throat> it's a good point so something that's solid 
doesn't take any of the force of the wind out of it, does it? The wind's just going to hit it and then be directed in another direction. So it, it creates a buffeting effect where trees kind of sway. So actually they're absorbing some of the energy of the wind. So the, the air coming behind it is lifted up and over um, because it's, it, it's, yeah, it's actually just taking a, some of the sting of the, with the speed of the, the energy of the wind is dissipating some of it slightly, and that's enough to lift what's coming behind it up and over. So that flow, understanding how energy flows, it just moves from one state to another, doesn't it? It doesn't go away. Um, yeah, no, I'm just thinking about that. It's interesting. Um, so I want to be challenge you all now to begin to think about how are you going to use this? I want you to apply these ideas that we're talking about to a real life situation. And it could be something small or it could be something more complex. It doesn't matter. Um, Stella, you might just think of your backyard or, 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 or not at all or somewhere completely else. Um, but um, Simon, I don't know what you have in mind um, of, of how you might use this. I mean, what I've seen with Deborah is many people have used this to design the compound around their house. So that might be interesting. But is I'm going to ask you to think about what are you going to design? What what what's the the dream that you want to come true? And and can we use what we're teaching you a permaculture methodology to do that? And maybe over the next few weeks, I can challenge you to begin your observation, asking your client, even if that client is you, it might be your wife, it might be the family, it might be know the people around, but identify who are we designing this for and begin to think about what information you might need to begin this process. Look around to see what materials there are what, or and what do people regard as waste? Or is, is there anything or do you notice anything being wasted or what are the leaks? Okay, get yourself a little notebook. Get yourself a little notebook. Write a few of these things down survey, survey the client, survey the site, ask about the history, identify the leaks. That's your homework. That's what I want you to begin now thinking about. So <clears throat> who is the client? Well, it might be you, or it might be perhaps your family group, or it might be the users of your compound, or, a, you know, you choose two or three, or you might come up with something completely different. Um, I, I, and, and, and if you have trouble thinking of ideas, then we can talk about that. But I know that, for example, uh, there's got the group at uh, Natchivali, they want to do a community garden. I think that's a nice thing to think about. So where is it? Can we draw a little map of it? Can we be aware of the boundaries? Um, what shape is it? H how can we represent the shape and the slope of a piece of land? Get a sense of its size. Um, uh, 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 and what's the soil like? Can we describe the soil there? What's, what's it like? Is it hard and compacted? What plants are growing there already? What, what, what plants have chosen to grow there? What, who used the land before you? What, what, what did they use it for? These are your observation questions. Can you start making some notes? Can you start drawing? It can be really sketchy and doesn't have to be tidy or anything. Make an approximate drawing of your of, of the space that you want to design um, and um, think about yeah, we're starting from patterns to detail so don't break yourself you know do, is it 20 it's about 20 or 30 meters or it's two or three meters or it's 10 meters you know it's okay give me the, the impression oh no it's it's a thousand meters okay We'll, we'll find exactly how many later on. We don't need to um, over-invest at the beginning because we're ranging around, we're seeing the possibilities. Now, I liked in that one um, uh, design methodology, it said, accept responsibility. Okay, you're in charge. Just imagine for a moment, if it was down to you or, or you know, a group of you, 
is, okay, let's put ourselves in charge. Let's feel responsible for this situation. How can we work with it? How can we work with change in a positive way to create yields that are going to help meet our needs? Um, what energy is there around that we can catch and store? Can we slow something down? Can we fold that into our productive systems? That, that's what you're... That's what you'll be that, that's what you're thinking about at the beginning of your permaculture design. Um, anything else? Shame we haven't got a few more contributors to chip in. Um, a really good way perhaps to start off your processes is literally is this idea of look to the leaks, as in unused things, things that are maybe you could get more value out of. Um, and that might turn out to be your key resource, because that's the thing that perhaps has not been valued previously, so it's there to be valued. Remember, there's no such thing as waste. So if you see something that looks like waste, it's an opportunity. Let's see how we might think strategically as, as designers. Remember, we talked about sometimes people are part of the waste stream. Sometimes people aren't... Um, you know, or a, a, a fantastic resource, people with spare time or people who want to learn something or people who haven't got their own um, uh, vision to know what to do. How do you build a relationship with them? How ca can you use your design to inspire them about possibilities? So I think that if <clears throat> by going through this process and showing a vision of what's possible, that's actually how you then set that process in motion. That, that, that's my experience. Um, and that's what we should be doing. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's, that's I think that's a, there's are really sort of thoughts on that for now. And as we are in session 13, um, uh, we're gonna begin now the observational process. Where's your opportunity for design? What's, who would the client be? And 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 you know, start ask, asking, making some of those observations. Yep, um, Gerald. Yes, Dave. Yeah, sure. Um, as 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 uh, discussed earlier, and I think it's uh, maybe also from. Uh, uh, an accountant point of view, I would be, you know, interested to see how to work out uh, kind of an enterprise development design. And uh, it would be interesting also to have probably a member or participants from the learning end switching roles and probably becoming the, we become the clients and they are the professionals or the team that is working on that or the designers. So we, that's something that I've been thinking about, but also it would be, we can also switch roles. Yes. And uh, as Steve has hinted that this could also be helpful in uh, shaping our teaching process or our enterprise model. Oh, Caroline is popping back in. So it would be really interesting to see that. And we can also switch tables and do bits of role play with, you know, another team or another group, yeah. Maybe um, just to elaborate on this, uh, and I think Steve hinted on it too, uh, we're looking at permaculture beyond gardening. We're looking at permaculture extensively. So probably someone would be wondering how does enterprise development end up into permaculture? We're looking at it more broadly and if you've been a part of these uh, sessions from, from whichever point you've joined, I'm sure you've realized that it goes beyond 
gardening, it goes beyond, uh, you know, farming and all that. Otherwise, if we restrict it to gardening, then we're nearly taking the agroforestry or the agriculture route. So let's look at it broadly. Your design could be beyond a garden. You could be designing a project to maybe hives or you're designing, you could look at it more broadly. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a garden or a homestead. We can look or think far and wide. Uh, Steve, back to you, <clears throat> Stella, Caroline. Uh, oh, Caroline, it's good to have you back. Mm -hmm. Sorry about the internet and, you know, it's keeping kicking you up. Yeah, thank you for those. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, so Caroline, we were just discussing about how we're going to apply our what we're learning on this course and, and wondering, challenging people if you have a design in mind, something you'd like to apply it to. But also, we'd like to hear more if you would be so kind to tell us about the teaching that you're doing. I understand that you, you arrange training sessions within more than one location in, in refugee settlements and you're teaching permaculture there. I'd love to just hear a little bit more about that if you would be so kind. Um, thank you so much, Steve. Um, what I'm doing is that uh, my first training, I did it in Kindu, that is a semi-arid area. And uh, the demonstration farm there is just meant to show people that it doesn't matter the kind of environment you, you, are, you, you, you find yourself in, you can be able to grow your own food there and not only your own food even get abundance that you can share with the community and uh, this was achieved in about two months after we set up the demonstration farm a family that was uh, spending about two british pounds on vegetables daily was able to be self-sufficient in vegetables in a span of, let's say six weeks. Yeah, after we did the demo garden, after six weeks, they could get lots of vegetables from the farm. And like in two months, they had enough to share. Um, so that one was my first training in Kindube. Homer Bay County. Then uh, I started uh, getting involved with the uh, Nakivale refugee camp. And uh, when we visited there, the land is very, very degraded because the, re uh, the settlement is uh, overpopulated. When people come, they chop down the trees because they need firewood, they need building materials. So another challenge the refugees are facing is a uh, lack of food and nutrition security. So we set up uh, a demonstration garden in a church compound because we felt that uh, the church compound is a public area people would walk in and see what we are doing and uh, most probably replicate it in their homes. That is apart from uh, the students who we are teaching, who of course are supposed to have the gardens uh, wherever they live, no matter how small the compound is. So we are also engaged in that. So the next training that I'm having right now, in about uh, maybe two and a half weeks time, I'm doing it in a place called Migori County. That is actually where I live. Um, but uh, 
it's a piece of land that I bought. I've not yet, uh, I've not yet, uh, how do you say, uh, done anything on it, you know? Uh, there's no infrastructure, but uh, we decided to set up uh, a permaculture demo garden also there. The challenge in Migori is a bit different from Kindu Bay and uh, maybe Nakivali. The difference here is that people do a lot of conventional farming. They use uh, seeds that they buy and uh, they also use synthetic fertilizer. So the soil is degraded in that way. So my reason for having this training here and uh, most probably a demo garden too, is that we want to show them that uh, there are different ways of achieving abundance. You can uh, farm organically, you can use permaculture to create abundance in that you do not have to farm one crop, remove it from the farm. And uh, at other times you find there's nothing on the farm. Another thing that uh, we really want to tell them about is the heirloom seeds. And especially in Kenya right now, where we are having this issue of, this issue of um, the government has outlawed seed saving and sharing. So this year's training, the theme is our seeds, our heritage. We are just telling the government that no, you cannot remove the power of um, our growing our own food from our hands, we need to strongly hold on to that power. And we can only do that, um, we can only do that when, you know, we can be able to do seed saving and sharing amongst ourselves. Um, the other thing in this area that we also really wanted to tell them is that synthetic, um, synthetic fertilizers messes up the soil systems. So we are hoping that um, we will be able to spread this message. And like today, I was just talking to one of the government leaders, you know, who's in charge of the area where we are having the training. And uh, this gentleman told me, can men come and attend the training? And I, I told him, why not? So long as the ladies are more than the men, we don't mind. And he asked, can I come and join? I'll be on leave at that time. And I told him, go ahead, just prepare yourself. You have to come in the morning, leave in the evening. So I'm thinking that um, people are already changing their outlook. They are uh, changing the way they do their farming. And uh, for me, because that is the place where I intend to build my home. Well, I think um, it's an exciting journey that, <laughs> that I'm starting <laughs> on this particular piece of land. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Caroline, it's really fascinating, and um, we must create more space now to, I want to hear, I've done all this talking now, I'm going to try and do less each week, and I want to, you know, sort of get more back from you, so thinking about questions, I'll end now, because we've used our time up, but Simon, if we're going to you know, invite you and the others, is you know, tell us more about how you want to use permaculture, what challenges you feel you're you're facing or opportunities do you want to you know explore and 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 think about how we're going to use these ideas as in a design sort of framework so um and so many anyone else is tuning in um as well is that's that this is our homework for everyone now is begin to do your observation begin to think about who's the client what, what, what are our challenges? What are the, the, the functions of the design we want to do? And, and, and yeah, start finding some of those details. So I'm going to 
say thank you very much, very much, everyone. We'll be at the same time next week. We will now stick to, sorry about the confusion with the time change, but we'll stick to our, uh, to this time now. And I'll say goodnight to everyone and a chance for anyone else to, any closing thoughts? Mm. Um, thanks, Caroline. That is really inspirational and timely. And yes, probably you're on the right course at the right time. And uh, it would be interesting to have that as your design project. And uh, probably one of the outputs of the course is sad. And, you know, I don't want to lament, but some of our governments or some of those politicians are really evil. And the way they are insisting on, you know, on things which should be meager, like burning, seed saving and sharing, uh, well as leaving out the bigger crisis and the dangers that are, you know, all around us. But I don't want to go political, join the lamenting club. Well, yeah, I, so Gerald, Gerald, I'll go, sorry, just to cut in, butt into your thing. I'll, I'll say one thing is it's often conditional of overseas aid investment packages and it's the big agro business seed companies look at african nations and india as just as a market to sell their export you know their their branded products to so they don't want you saving seed they want you to buy gm corn that's got a you know a a, a patent on it so sadly that's it, it's and the governments are strong armed as well. So it's not always the fault of the governments, but it is the fault, the fault of large corporations who just want to make profit out of growing food. Oh, wow, sad. Yeah, so it's been a pleasure. It's been a very interesting session, very informative. And thanks everyone for the participation. Uh, this is a, a very interesting phase we've gone into very interesting and yes we're looking forward to lots of participation unless anyone else has a comment we will end it at this point simon okay bye uh, everybody okay caroline thanks bye, -bye. thanks caroline bye 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 everyone bye, -bye. bye.